Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be back. I was off doing something that was... So, don't ask me, please. Thanks. Anyway, let's get on to today's lesson. This is a long one, folks. You may or may not have heard of this skip, but today we're going to be learning about SCP-93. Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. See Testing Document SCP-93-T1 for outline of testing conditions. SCP-93 must remain on a mirror at all times and under video surveillance. Admittance into the area of SCP-93's containment must be authorized only with proper video recording and subject retrieval procedures in place. Any attempt to use SCP-93 outside of an approved test will be dealt with severely, up to and including termination. Description SCP-93 is a primarily red disc carved from a stone composite resembling cinnabar, with circular engravings and unknown symbols carved at 0.5 cm depth around the entire object. Deeper cuts are present on SCP-93 with a depth of 1 to 1.5 cm. SCP-93 is 7.62 cm in diameter and fits comfortably into most palms without abrasion. SCP-93 will change hue when held by a living individual. The colors taken by SCP-93 are still being researched to establish a link. Current beliefs hold that the changes depend upon regrets carried by the holder. If SCP-93 is removed from a mirror and not held by a person, it will seek out the nearest mirror-like surface. SCP-93 has been observed to travel in the largest possible circle while rolling, building up phenomenal speed. The mechanism of this acceleration is currently unknown. If an obstacle is between SCP-93 and the nearest mirror-like surface, it will use this momentum to punch through the obstacle and continue on its course at this speed. It will only stop when a mirror-like surface is contacted. Despite tremendous impact velocities, no damage will be dealt to SCP-93 or the mirror. Additional Notes No records exist to clarify the nature of SCP-93's discovery or presence in the Foundation. See SCP-93-OD. Since no records exist explaining SCP-93's method of containment, a test procedure was initiated to establish why mirrors must be used to contain it. The results of SCP-93-T1 led to the discovery of living beings holding SCP-93 being able to move through mirrors, and the series of tests in SCP-93-T2 to ascertain the destination reached through this travel. Now what I just read was revised. The original documentation is as follows. SCP-93, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. Item SCP-93 is to be kept on a silver-lined mirror on a 0.3 by 0.23 meter pedestal at least 1.22 meters off the ground in containment cell block. Object is not to be contained in areas exceeding 3.66 by 3.05 meters, nor placed on mahogany, pine, cherry, or aluminum pedestals above or below level 1 of containment cell block. Object can be handled safely, albeit gently, without consequences. Tests and consequences thereof involving containment conditions can be viewed in section B351 of the attached report. Description object was found on the shore of the Red Sea, 30th of January, 1968, emitting a low sigh and a dim blue gleam. Its color has since turned into an orange mix of red, only emitting a hum of varying volume whilst in the presence of female examiners of ages between 34 and 41. SCP-93 resembled the documented blue for 54 minutes, 34 seconds, at 1.23, on the 26th of April, 1986. Coincidentally, when the body of 1949834 was discovered in a research facility, ties between 1949834 and SCP-93 remain inconclusive, and effects of prolonged exposure to 93 remain unknown, except for infrequent reports of periods of calmness, and in the case of 2420049, as periodic waves of depression, loss of balance, and thoughts of suicide. These feelings have reportedly not exceeded 11 days in duration. 
Objects seem to react to the presence of 2420056 by turning light violet for no more than 2 minutes, 9 seconds. As documented on the 12th of March, 1993, effects of this reaction remain unknown. Additional notes. Origins of 93 remain unknown, and documents of recovery of 93 have since been destroyed in a fire in research facility. 9th of December, 1989. Reports on the feelings of researchers who handled 93 have remained inconsequential since the 19th of April, 1995. Okay, moving on to SCP 93 T1 containment test. Testing of SCP-93 against conditions set forth for existing containment procedures to assess viability of continuing such containment, beginning with changing the type of mirror used as a position of rest. Mirrored surface, brass frame, retail grade mirror. SCP-93 rests without activity when placed on the mirror. This test alone removes the need for costly silver or wooden containment systems. Standard grade table, SCP-93 turns upright and begins to roll across the table surface in one direction, making a U-turn and rolling to the other, completing an oval shape and repeating this action until a mirror is brought into its vicinity, at which time SCP-93 rolls toward the mirror and lays flat ways against it, sliding towards the center. It is noted that despite the grainy feel of SCP-93, it does not mark the mirror in any fashion while moving across it. Two mirrors at either end of a standard grade table. SCP-93 gravitates toward the closer mirror regardless of orientation and makes no distinction between different types of mirrors, favoring a factor of distance above all else in choosing the mirror to move to. A mirror held by a person and moved around. SCP-93 follows the mirror as it moves, gaining speed until a maximum velocity of is reached. At any velocity, the impact of SCP-93 against a mirrored surface results in no damage to either object. A person holding SCP-93, placing it on a mirror. This test was accidental, the result of one of the staff tripping the other after some debate about who would be covering the lunch tab. As a result of the behavior of the researchers, it was discovered that a person holding SCP-93 and placing it against a mirror will in fact move into the mirror. Addendum. Containment testing discontinued after establishing that SCP-93 requires only a mirror to rest inert. Testing on human interaction with mirrors while holding SCP-93 authorized by Dr. SCP-93-T2 Mirror Test Testing Protocols Subjects testing SCP-93 must wear a Class 3 buckle harness strapped to the chest and attached to a tension pulley system allowing for 300 meters of movement. Additional spools may be added to extend movement if necessary. The clasps connecting these spools must be high grade and capable of withstanding applied force of 0.2 tons. A field kit containing the following should be standard issue for testing of SCP-93. One wrist-mounted light source with three hours lifespan and additional power sources providing up to six additional hours. Four 0.5 liter water bottles with water. Four MREs of any type, plus two plain granola bars. Chocolate chips allowed. One standard issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 24 rounds of ammunition, loaded. This is not to be issued until subject is passed into a mirror using SCP-93 and should be given under armed supervision ensuring that the subject passes through entirely. This item is to be requisitioned first upon subject's return and subject to be made aware of this before leaving line of sight within SCP-93's mirror. And finally, one standard issue field knife. The subject is not to be made aware of this item and must find it on his own within the kit. The subject must also be attached to a video system, with a camera mounted on the subject's head or shoulders. The video device should be cable-based and allow for the same length of travel as the return system. 
wireless cameras have shown mixed results and should only be used in testing conditions where SCP-93 is a currently known color. New colors must be tested using a wired feed. During testing, the color of SCP-93 must be recorded, as well as history of the subject in terms of their incarceration to identify how SCP-93 determines the color to assume. A link appears to be connected to guilt or lack thereof in the subject's psyche. The attached test results should be read in order. Okay, I will now go through mirror test 1 to 5. Buckle up, people. If you've any coffee to get, now's the time to get it. We good? Okay. Mirror test 1. Color, blue. Subject is D20384. Male, 34 years of age, strong physique. Subject's background shows instance of murder and attempted suicide. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-93, which emitted a blue color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to an outdoor landscape, heavily tinged in blue. Video feed follows in attached media. Obviously you're not going to see the video feed I will be describing. Camera activates, flickers into view. Subject is looking out over the same field reported by technicians. Looks like typical lowland plains. Everything has a heavy blue tinge overlapping the normal colors. No discernible landmarks visible as subject pans view left to right. Only grass, weeds, and a breeze moving the taller grass. No trees, no living beings visible. Subject moves forward as instructed traveling for approximately 500 steps before something becomes visible. A patch of land up ahead is barren and grass can be seen dying as the subject approaches it. Approximately 300 steps forward, subject is standing before a hole in the ground. The hole has been dug using unknown tools of primitive origin. Pulley system engaged and the camera suffers a light shutter. Subject is instructed to enter the hole. After a mile protesting, agrees to do so. There is no apparent method of descent, such as ladder or rope. Subject relies entirely on his own hands and the pulley system to slow the descent. Approximately 100 meters of cable is used before a bottom is reached. Light source provided in field kit activated 50 meters down when outside sources become unreliable. Sweeping gestures of light reveal nothing more than dirt even at the bottom of the hole. Subject moves forward with assistance of light source. Asked about the blue tinge, subject expresses confusion and says there is no such tinge from his perspective, and never was. Light is visible down the passage and 150 meters of cable has been used. Out of the camera's eye, sound is recorded of the firearm being prepared. When questioned about these actions, subject states justified precaution and moves forward. The tunnel turns from bare dirt to a concrete enclosure. Subject complains of a stench. The light source is revealed to be ceiling light fixtures, a series of which with less than a quarter broken while all others function. A series of six doors, three to a side, span before the camera view with a seventh door visible at the end of the corridor that has been blocked by what looks like generic metal shelving debris. Debris shows sign of rusting and is typical of retail store units suggesting other human presences. Subject requested to try doors in whatever order he chooses. Subject tries first door on right, door is locked, does not open. Second door tries to open but does not budge, unlocked but blocked by something. Closing second door, third door is tried, same results as first. Going up the other side, the third door does open fully and light is bright in the room. Portable light switched off at this time as subject pans camera to inspect the room. Room is bare, no contents, but walls are filthy. Subject states material on walls isn't dirt, but he can't identify it. Seems to resemble melted plastic, but is brown in color rather than black. Door is closed. Second door on left has no handle, does not move when pushed. The hole where the handle was is plugged by an unknown material. 
All doors are shaped in such a way that nothing can visibly escape from the sides, and space for movement is too thin to look through, even at ground level. First door on the left hand is locked, but part of the key is present in lock from stem to the ridges. Back has been broken off. With effort, subject manipulates key to open door and immediately begins coughing, complaining of a stench. Walls of room are clean, as is floor. Ceiling is coated in the same strange brown material as the third room. In this room, there is a makeshift cot made from aged blankets with a pillow, a wooden crate containing open boxes of what appear to have been foodstuffs. Language appears on video as squiggles. However, subject states that they simply read cereal. A second crate in the room contains what appear to be empty water bottles that have dried out. A book lays next to the cot, closed, no title or identifying marks. On the wall is what appears to be clipped articles, but language cannot be read. Subject asks to remove clippings for retrieval. All articles but one crumble at the touch due to age. The intact article is put in a field sample container and seems to be most recent compared to others. Asked to investigate the book, subject begins to move toward it. Audio on the tape goes strange and a high-pitched screeching noise like grinding metal dominates all communication for about three and a half seconds. Subject has not touched the book still, and when the noise stops, subject asks Control to repeat request. Control made no requests during that time as headsets were removed. Subject advised to leave the room, and notes that the door has begun closing slowly on its own, and if left alone, will close. Subject advised to leave door alone, and to investigate the door on the right. Careful review of the following 10 seconds of tape shows that as the camera pans, a figure is visible at the end of the tunnel where the seventh door is. The door is open only for a face to be seen through a crack just before the door silently closes. No details can be seen. Subject investigates the second door on the right with no mention of anything seen out of the ordinary. This door when pushed against moves. After repeated bashings, moves enough to view inside at an angle. A cork board is visible, with more articles attached to it. The top of the box of cereal can be seen on the floor, and what appears to be a hand laying palm up. Subject closes door and pans camera past door 7, which remains closed. Seeing nowhere else to explore, subject requested to return. Subject poses no protest and complains of ever-increasing stench. As subject returns back down tunnel, his camera feed does not change or show anomaly, but control reports a sudden surge in cable movement, pulling an additional 100 meters of cable through before going slack again and then tightening. Video feed shows subject ascending tunnel slowly while control attempts to verify integrity of the pulley system. Subject requested to stop ascent, but states he is not climbing. The rope is pulling him up. Panic sets in on both sides, and subject informed to ready firearm. Upon reaching top of hole, nothing is visible on camera and subject reports nothing has changed in the landscape, then begins a return trip following the path of the cable. Traveling for approximately 900 steps, subject asks how much cable he has used. Control admits they are unsure due to complications, but subject traveled in a straight line to reach the hole, so it should be a straight line back. Subject becomes concerned when he states that more cable is visible now, moving in a 90 degree angle away from a point in the ground. Subject pans camera around full circle slowly. On film, behind subject, a crowd of 37 countable figures stand silently. Features are unidentifiable and they are lacking the blue tinge that dominates the landscape. Panic breaks in control again, but the subject notes only oddity as being the cable having an angled path. Subject tugs his end of the cable. It is taut and does not move. Control begins to reel in the pulley system, and slack rapidly winds. Watching the angled cable movement can be seen, as grass is disturbed further down the angled portion from the reeling in. Then the line vibrates as it meets resistance and emits a twang from the recoil. Subject's camera pans back along the length of the cable, which now appears to be slowly allowing more slack, before suddenly all slack is returned and pulley system begins again. 
Control requests subject return following cable path and screams are caught on the audio with panic from the subject. Five shots fired as subject aims pistol at something not visible on camera. Control reports being able to see subject returning toward a point of origin, while camera shows wire disappearing into a floating point in the air. As subject passes this point, all cable is now in the pulley system and camera films only the door. Control reports that the mirror took approximately five seconds to return to a reflection and SCP-93 remained blue in color until one hour after being recovered from the subject. A vile smelling fluid was present on the subject's clothes around his hands when the firearm was recovered. This fluid dried quickly and was deemed insignificant of study due to a lack of quality sample. Control personnel monitoring the mirror state having seen a massive human being crawling on the ground, easily 50 times the size of a normal person, with no facial features and a very short arm reach, pulling itself towards the mirror before it returned to a reflection. Due to proximity, fine details could not be made out, but at least one observer noted the being appeared to have been shot from the marks in the otherwise smooth, featureless face. Field test kit recovered from subject containing a newspaper article that reads, and was filed as items. Okay, this is mirror test two, color green. Subject is D54493, female, 23 years of age. Average physique. Subject's background shows instance of grand theft auto and second degree murder of two children during escape with vehicle. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-93, which had emitted a green color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a farming landscape, heavily tinged in green. Similar to the first test, video feed follows in attached media. And again, you will not be seeing anything, I will be describing it. Camera activates, flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same farmland reported by technicians. All greens through the video feed are deeper and green tinge overlays the normal colors of objects similar to the blue tinge in test one. No landmarks from test one are discernible as subject pans camera over the area. Present is a field, long abandoned, in the middle of which stands the remains of a scarecrow of unknown design. Fragments left are rotted and torn. Nothing grows in the tilled land. A farmhouse is visible to the right of the field. Large, two stories. A basement shelter entrance is visible at one end. Subject prepares her sign arm immediately and is asked by control to relax before proceeding, her heavy breathing dominating the audio feed. Subject takes a few minutes and announces that she is fine and then proceeds as directed to walk the perimeter of the farmhouse. Children's bicycles, two. A boy and a girl's lay against the house near the shelter doors. One of the doors to the shelter lay in the grass, torn from the entrance, as evidenced by splintering wood. On the stairs lay clothes arranged in a descending order, shoes to shirt going down them, belonging to a boy. Subject begins screaming at Control, asking if this is some sort of sick joke. Control assures her that they have never seen this environment either, and to please calm down. Subject takes several minutes to regain herself before continuing. It is unknown if SCP-93 is linking the subject's past with her landscape. After several minutes, subject agrees to continue. Communication to subject is muted, and conversation of control making commentary about subject's jittery attitude make up audio for one and a half minutes. Communication is restored and subject reaches bottom of stairs. The cellar of the farmhouse is unremarkable and typical. Several wooden shelves line the far wall, containing unidentified canned substances. Broken light fixtures sway gently from the support beams. Camera is panned across the basement slowly. No evidence of footprints are visible, and the basement can be assumed to have been abandoned for some time. Subject begins to comment about a stench. As subject pans the area, a metal hatch is visible into the ground, similar to a bulkhead on a submarine with a turn handle. Subject remarks that the smell is at its worst around the hatch, and the dirt around the hatch is noted as being clumped and clay-like. The handle of the hatch is old and the paint is chipped. Subject coerced into touching the handle, which when fully turned, 
opens the hatch. Subject begins coughing at the release of assumed old stale air. When camera is tilted to view down the hatch, it is a white concrete tunnel similar to the one found in the blue experiment, but in much better condition. Subject asks to descend ladder and close hatch behind her. After some convincing, subject agrees to descend, but does not close the hatch. Overlooked concerns about severing the pulley return system in doing so are acknowledged. Descent down the ladder and trip to the farmhouse has consumed approximately 53 meters of cable when bottom is reached. Inside of the hatch appears to be a bunker, ill-suited to long-term usage. It is spacious, about half the size of the actual cellar itself, containing three bunks, one for a couple, and two for single use. Several boxes of food, similar to those found during Blue, marked as cereal, fill a waste container near the hatch bottom. On the beds are two skeletons, and on the floor is a third, lying next to which is a simple six-shooter revolver containing no ammunition. Three spent casings are across the floor near the gun. On the other side of the skeleton is a bound book in good condition. This is retrieved and placed into a field kit container upon request. The gun is left alone per request from control. Subject examines more of the bunker, focusing on a desk where a newspaper has been cut and is in good condition. The clipped articles are recovered using a field kit container. Little else of interest to be brought back is in the bunker as the camera is panned around. Trash bags containing clothing, a few children's toys resembling popular 1950s era products are lined against the wall. Subject is requested to leave the bunker and then sharply asked to wait by a control technician who directs the camera view to an area near the exiting doorway to the hatch. Closer inspection as subject moves in, finds that a small area has been fitted with what appears to be an ethernet jack, the cover of which has been forced slightly away from the wall by a strange amber-like substance. Subject refuses to touch or collect a sample, commenting that it stinks so bad. If they want it, they can come and get it themselves. Control declines and the subject leaves the bunker. As subject grips ladder to leave, the camera pans up for a moment and at the top of the tunnel, a humanoid figure is seen peering down. Control asks subject to confirm figure. Subject states nothing is up there and begins to climb. Figure draws out of camera view after first rung is touched by subject who ascends without incident. At the top of the tunnel, no other life is seen. Nothing has been disturbed. Subject insists nothing was there and closes the hatch then immediately vomits. Subject coughs and uses a supplied water bottle to gargle, then freezes and asks if Control is hearing that. Control reports no audio. Subject approaches cellar hatch cautiously with a firearm drawn and lifts her head just enough so camera can view outside area. In the distance, approximately 700 meters from farm, two massive humanoid beings are crawling across the landscape. The entities do not notice the subject who remains quiet, but whose drawn sidearm is visibly trembling. Subject requested to remain still and silent as beings move. They are featureless, facing at an angle, moving across the field of vision so the faces are only visible for a few moments. During this time, it is clear they have no facial features. The arms they use to drag themselves are short at times and long at others, stretching out to varying lengths each time they move. There is no rear area to the beings. All bodily design appears to end at the torso. The two creatures take approximately 10 minutes to disappear into the distance before the subject begins to panic and begs to return. Request declined. Subject instructed to enter the home from the cellar and not to leave the home under any circumstances. The first floor is entered through a hatch in the ceiling floor that opens with rusty creaks that cause subject to pause for 37 seconds before continuing upward and entering a kitchen. A heavy layer of dust coats all items in the kitchen. The refrigerator is left open, all food is spoiled. Adjacent the kitchen is a living area that subject enters slowly. There is a recliner, a couch, a television of all 1950s style design. In the recliner is a laptop whose case resembles a 1950s decor and is coated and heavy dust. Opening the laptop reveals the last moments of its operating system. Faithful OS. Leaving a standby mode and immediately shutting off. Laptop has no external power source and will not power back on. 
When asked to recover the laptop, it brings the cushion of the recliner with it, the two stuck together. Subject advised to leave the laptop where it is. The inside door leaving the home is nailed shut with thick wood planks. No attempt made to interact with these. Camera view pans to a staircase leading upstairs. Subject ascends the stairs without being asked, and the stairs remain silent to control surprise. When subject reaches top of the stairs, a hallway with two doors is viewed, one on each side. At the end of the hall, a dumbwaiter is inlaid into the wall. Subject opens door on left on her own, which opens to a master bedroom. The bed is neatly made, but the wardrobe next to it is thrown open, and clothes are everywhere on the floor. Subject finds laid out on the bed several pieces of jewelry and is informed to leave them. Subject begins to protest, then comments they stink and leaves them alone. Promptly leaving the room, subject is asked to open second door. The second door opens and gives a view of a shared children's bedroom, obviously boy and girl, given the types of toys and clothes scattered on the floor. There is also a window, which subject approaches and wipes with a curtain to clear dust. Subject requested to move camera to window and does so. The farmland is visible, approximately 40 kilometers from it, at best guess, a city. As the camera starts to draw back, it pans down and films the area around the house. Approximately 300 figures, similar to those from the footage captured during Blue Test, are visible around the home, all staring up. The subject asks to confirm figures, but states nothing is there. Subject requested to return and quickly agrees. Egress from the house is uneventful. Pulley system shows no erratic behavior. As subject returns to point of pulley wire's origin, a loud groaning noise causes the picture to reverberate. Technicians at control report they were also able to hear the noise and experience the vibration. Subject returns through point of origin without investigation and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-93 relinquished. Video ends. Return newspaper fragments filed as... Next, we are moving on to mirror test three, color violet. Subject is D84930, male, 21 years of age, average physique. Subject's background shows instance of second degree murder of a police officer during a drug bust. Normally this crime, while severe, would not qualify a person for a sentence that would end up with us, but the murder of the officer was especially brutal and excessive violence was used. This subject was uncooperative and had to be reminded that his cooperation would only benefit him. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-93, which emitted a violet color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a cityscape, urban, lightly tinged in purple, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. By now, you know the drill. Camera flickers to life and pans around the area. Subject is in what appears to be a modern downtown district, similar to a city like New York. The streets are mostly bare, except for a few cars of unknown make or model. These cars look highly advanced and streamlined. Subject attempts to look into car windows without being instructed, but backs away remarking there is a rank ass stank coming from the areas around most of them. Subject is persuaded to move closer to one car and does so with coughing, wiping off a window which is covered in dirt. The inside of the car appears to be completely filled with a strange brown matter. There is nothing at all visible other than the brown matter. The other two cars produce the same results. However, a fourth vehicle seems more recent than the others, and the insides are immaculate. The doors to this vehicle are also unlocked, and the subject gets quickly inside and shuts the doors. Subject is chastised for his behavior by control, who reminds him his lifeline is nothing more than a cable, which is sturdy enough that closing a car door does not injure it, but they cannot recover a person in motion. Subject argues with control over this issue and pans the camera across the dashboard, pointing out he couldn't drive away even if he tried. The dashboard is void of any recognizable controls. No ignition, no steering. It has several small blank screens that are theorized to be a GPS system. 
Subject remains in the car while Control discusses how to proceed since the cityscape is far larger than the previous test destinations. Control debates this issue while Subject stares around the cityscape from the car. During one pan, a face is clearly seen staring into the car, eyes watching the subject. However, this was not noticed until post-test footage review. Subject made no comment regarding this entity at any point. Control shortly after informs the subject to remain where he is and an escort team is dispatched through the mirror to join him. A team of four armed personnel is sent through the mirror and proceeds to subject's location. Subject is instructed to remove his harness, which is recovered. This subject's video feed then ends and is replaced by a wireless unit by the escort team. The video quality on this unit is subject to more interference, but in order to mark the mirror exit, a receiver system is placed through the mirror. Subject leaves the car and now travels with the escort team. Given the myriad of possible options, they are instructed to simply move to the closest building and attempt to enter it. This building has etched glass doors bearing the name XEA Research Partners Incorporated, and the doors are ajar. A magnetic lock system is present, but has lost power. Team enters the building and main lobby. This area resembles a stereotypical corporate lobby. There is a C-shaped receptionist desk with a chair pushed far from it as if it was left in a hurry. A PC terminal is at the desk as well. Team approaches the desk and the camera bearer is instructed to examine the PC. The unit does appear to have power and Faithful OS appears on the screen, requesting a login and password. A keyboard is present, but is remarkably slim with touch sensitive keys rather than press down keys. After one failed attempt, the lock screen replies that maximum attempts have been exceeded and the PC turns off. No actual tower or power button can be located, so team moves forward. Behind the reception desk are two elevators, one to the left and one to the right, with similar touch sense keys. The elevator on the left is broken, the door open and the shaft empty. The elevator on the right appears to be functional and has power. Without a clear destination, the team is instructed to proceed to the highest floor to get a lay of the city. All floors appear to be accessible, with the highest being 114. In reality, 112, as 13 and 113 are missing from the keypad. Journey up the elevator is uneventful during this time. The elevator does appear to take longer as it passes by 13 and then 113, suggesting that the entire floor was built and nothing put on it. At 114, the doors open and the team enters a large lounge type area. There are many couches with dust on them. A widescreen, apparently LCD TV of approximately 60 plus inches in size dominates the wall in front of them with no power. A series of windows are open, allowing in sunlight at the far end to which the team proceeds and angles the camera outside. The view of the city is astonishing. This building is one of the tallest visible but certainly not alone in its stature. The city below is gray and silent. No evidence of life at this altitude. Some buildings in the city have a strange brown growth that appears to have been splashed against them as if a gelatinous mass was flung and then seeped down before hardening. Other buildings have floors where the glass has been shattered and the same brown substance is seeping out the edges. One member of the team calls the camera bearer to the windows on the other side. From the other side of the building, City edges can be seen. Attention is pointed towards an expressway that encircles the city upon which crawls another of the large half-body humanoids, dragging itself with its elastic arms as witnessed in previous tests. It travels the highway, then moves out of sight. The team returns to the elevator and notes that a button has already been activated on floor 74. No one has approached the elevator, so the team agrees to travel to this floor. On the 74th floor, the doors open and reveal a waiting area to what appears to be a doctor's office. At the reception desk, there is a sign-in sheet with a series of names and dates. The dates on the sign-in sheet all carry the year 1953. A PC at the receptionist area is on and functioning at a user desktop. The background for the PC is a large set of praying hands with the word Faithful OS underneath them. On the desktop are a series of folders with years on them containing files that, when clicked, using the center button of the mouse, open to a word viewer. All files appear to be appointment information. On the desk is a notepad titled, From the Desk of Dr. Boraziski, Blessed Purificationist. The door to the doctor's area is sketched with the same name and title 
as well as a crucifix. Opening this door leads to a white, dust-free hallway that has two examination rooms and a key-coded door at the end. The examination rooms are unremarkable and typical of any doctor's office. All medical cabinets are empty. A small amount of C4 is placed at the lock to the key-coded door at the request of control and then blown, forcing the door open. The area it opens into is much larger than the reception area itself and seems to contain a series of large containment capsules. There are a total of six of these capsules. Two are broken and a brownish amber material coats the floor coming from them. One is empty. The last three have nude humans floating in them with breathing masks. Attached to the front of these tubes are medical charts showing vital signs and conditions. For symptoms, the charts explain in somewhat awkward English ailments that seem more like flaws of personality or character, or just incidents that have occurred with the patient. Control asks for a zoom of one of the patient pages on the chart. After focusing, it reads, Citizen Jennifer McZerka that did suffer a lapse of the heart that did lead to her to lay with her neighbor twice upon nights of her husband's departure from their home. Patient did submit herself into the Lord's and our hands for cleansing of mind and body. Prayer administered by High Father Ualakin and patient submitted to a three-day period in the Lord's tears to cleanse her system, then released in good spirits. The topmost page reads, Citizen Alberius Farafon struck out at a high father during sermon, blaspheming that the Lord's tears did turn his daughter to be unright in mind and heart, thusly laying blame for her whorish activities at the feet of the high father and his blessing. With no proof of these blasphemies, the forgiving judge and the punishing judge did agree that Alberius Farafon should bathe in the Lord's tears himself for a week to be cleansed of mind and soul, thus to prove his daughter's ways are fault not of the father's hands, and to give him peace of self. Subject who has been traveling quietly with the escort team now begins to panic. The camera pans to focus on him, and he is surrounded by entities similar to those witnessed in the first two tests. Escort team reports in that Subject is having a panic attack, but Control requests them to stand still and wait. Subject screams at the entities which are denied to exist by Team Commander, stating Subject is alone in the corner. Control requests that one team member be dispatched to approach and recover the subject. The escort team member approaches the subject as ordered. On the video, the figures part to make a pathway for the approaching member who lifts Subject to his feet and brings him out of the corner. Figures on the video are seen closing ranks to close the path. Subject is lifted to his feet by an arm and escorted through the figures that close their ranks when the subject is moved. They remain steadfastly staring at the subject no matter where he moves to. Control requests the team return now. Team turns to leave. Before leaving, a team member mentions something noticed at the reception desk. A binder labeled The Lord's Tears. Control requests binder be returned as well and is stowed into subject's field kit. The team returns to the elevator and returns to the ground floor. Upon leaving the building, Subject points down the street toward direction of entry point. The camera pans to a section of raised expressway across which one of the large torsos is crawling slowly. The entity turns its featureless head to look at the escort team, raises its head to the sky and emits a bellowing sound. Team leader issues the order to move, heading for the spot marked by the wireless video receiver. The creature on the expressway extends an arm down that stretches to touch the ground before the camera moves to the port. All team members save one move through the entry point. Subject moves through entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-93 is dropped by subject who panics and tries to fight his way out of the room. Subject is terminated by leader after he draws the field kit pistol. Team leader requests portal be reopened, but it takes several minutes to find someone who can hold SCP-93 and generate a similar color. When a matching color is displayed and applied to the mirror, the video receiver is visible and all individuals report a horrific smell. Team leader moves through the entryway with the control person, the uniform and possessions of the escort team member who was left behind are present and recovered. But the member himself is nowhere to be seen and does not respond to shouts. Member assumed killed in action and wireless receiver recovered. Control and escort return through entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. 
Later review of the recovered camera shows escort members grasping at the air where the entry point should be and then turning to look up at the oversized torso. A brown gel seems to drip off the creature as it moves that disappears shortly after being dislodged, as if evaporating. Several shots are fired at the creature's face with the automatic weapon carried by that land in the face of the creature, causing a spray of less viscous brown liquid to pour forth from the wounds. Screams obscenities as the face of the creature descends upon him, and the camera is pushed to the ground. Camera feed remains dark for approximately 65 seconds before light comes back and the camera films the creature crawling back to the expressway and pulling itself onto it, and then crawling in the direction it was originally headed, believed to have been absorbed by the creature and perhaps digested. This may have been an example of how these unknown entities feed by direct contact with living material. Further study is recommended to be avoided on this issue. Returned ledger filed as Okay, this is mirror test four. Color, yellow. D-class subjects no longer authorized for testing. Testing focus has been shifted to data collection after analyzing the articles brought back from the previous three tests to better understand the fate of the world accessed by SCP-93 and determine if safeguards or practices are required for our own world. Analysis of the brown fluid and the clothing of the lost escort team members has been filed with other recovered articles. Dr. has volunteered for this test as, out of the possible candidates, he was able to cause SCP-93 to undergo a new color change. There is no evidence of Dr. background of any illegal or criminal behavior, nor of any psychological problems. When presented to the mirror, the view changed to that of a cubicle office environment. For this test, Dr. opted to use the wireless video system and forego the pulley return system stating he was confident he would be safe, as none of the torso creatures have been witnessed within a building where the mirror's destination showed. Video feed commences after Dr. has crossed the mirror. As with prior tests, SCP-93's current color, yellow, tinges all video material. Camera flickers to life and pans across a series of plain white cubicle constructs. Approximately 30 are visible. At the far end, from the point of entry, is an office module built into the wall with frosted glass walls and a glass door. Dr. G approaches this door and investigates the etched writing on it. Senior Manager, Stanley Milovitz. The door is unlocked. Dr. G enters the office and examines the desk. A coffee cup is on the desk, a dark brown stain covering half of the inside as the liquid evaporated. There is a donut on a plate, which Dr. G picks up and lobs at a wall. On impact, it thumps like a rock and falls. A file cabinet in the corner of the room draws Dr. G's attention, and he goes through each shelf one at a time, stopping in the second drawer and taking out a file, then going back to the first and taking out two others. Continuing to the third and fourth drawers, he withdraws four additional files and spreads them all out on the desk. The files are blue filing folders. He points with his finger and camera at a symbol on each of praying hands stating aloud for the camera that all other files are stored in yellow folders. The blue folders are placed in his field kit. Camera attention is turned to the PC on the desk that is logged in and functional. Dr. comments aloud, wondering where these devices are getting their power from, as he has noticed no power outlets. This PC's desktop contains the logo of Faithful OS and even has sounds. Clicks of the mouse followed by soft hymn-like hums and opening of icons followed by angelic bells. The PC fails to yield any useful information to Dr. G, who abandons it and leaves the office. Approaching the other end of the office, Dr. G presses a button on the wall for the elevator and enters, finding he is on the 34th floor of a building, having an unusual number scheme. The keypad layout goes from minus 115 to 115 and includes all floors. Before pressing a floor button, Dr. G requests that the wireless video transponder be moved to the elevator and replaced with a construction cone to mark the entry point. A second transponder unit is placed outside the elevator and control is instructed to recover the second unit and seal the test chamber should something happen to him. Then when all is arranged, he presses the button for floor minus 115. The descent down the elevator is long 
consuming 15 minutes. During this time, the camera experiences one malfunction where the image jerks and turns to snow, restoring to show 14 other figures in the elevator with Dr. as the video pans around, all of whom move as he moves to allow him space. They remain for 35 seconds, and then the camera flickers to snow and returns. Dr. G is now alone in the elevator, dancing, as is assumed by the ducks and sways of the video feed. Dr. G pauses to comment on a rising stench coming from below. At this point, the elevator has reached floor minus 108. Dr. G presses minus 110 to interrupt the descent down and exits when that floor is reached. The elevator doors open to an enclosed observation deck with several PCs and chairs. All PCs appear to have power. The ceiling to this deck is also glass, and above it another deck is visible. Dr. G approaches the monitoring stations and checks one of the PC screens. On the screen is the Faithful OS logo and a video feed toggling between four different views. The first view is a room of tubes similar to those found in Test Violet, which number in the thousands. The second view is a closer up view of these tubes, as a camera glides in front of each to monitor the contents. All tubes the camera passes by are broken. The third view is facing the opposite direction as a camera glides vertically, checking each observation station. A total of 10 can be counted, and Dr. G is visible as the camera passes by his own station. Looking up, a hovering camera unit with no visible means of propulsion glides up past him. The fourth view shows the ground floor below the observation deck, where a single astonishingly large torso is crawling in circles, bumping into walls and changing directions. From the camera feed to the creature's estimated size is six stories. Returning attention to the contents of the PC, Dr. Gears moves the video log aside to see a simple text editor that was hidden behind it. A printout of this text was recovered and filed in the field kit. The printout directed Dr. Gears to a safe on floor 54 and provided a combination. Dr. Gears leaves the observation deck and proceeds to 54 without event. Arriving on a cubicled office floor, he proceeds to the desk mentioned in the document and found a safe hidden beneath a desk undisturbed. The combination provided opens the safe and reveals a notebook filed in the field kit and a peculiar revolver that has been returned as in addition to the 24 rounds of ammunition found with it. Dr. Gips proceeds back to the elevator without a vent and returns to 34. Given the sheer number of floors available to explore and the vital information obtained from the observation deck, the test is considered over and the equipment retrieved. Before returning through the entry point, Dr. investigates a terminal nearby that has power and finds it shows the exact same screen as the one on minus 110 shows. It is theorized that the author of the note installed a network virus to propagate through the building, so any PC on that network would be found and the information discovered. Dr. returns through the entry point and the mirror returns to a reflective surface. All materials filed with other SCP-93 recovered materials. Analysis of and the ammunition for it postponed for reason that it would require deconstruction of one of the rounds and they may be beneficial until testing of SCP-93 is resolved. Video ends. And finally, mirror test 5 color red. SCP-93 distributed amongst staff until a new color could be generated by contact with it. Service technician was able to cause SCP-93 to take on a fierce red hue and glow, much brighter than the object's normal color. Agreed to assist with a test of SCP-93, per Dr. request, given to technician for use in this test. When applied to the mirror for the test, SCP-93 generates an unknown environment. No color tinge appears present on the displayed destination, which is comprised of red stonework. Technician enters the mirror and the video capture begins. Video flickers to life and Technician, known hereafter as Subject, is viewing a large cylindrical pillar that is rotating on its own. Object is of unknown height and appears to be 1.8 meters in width. Holes are distributed throughout the object at seemingly random intervals. On occasion, a beam of white light is emitted from these holes, 
Turning of the camera finds that the beams are connected to a multitude of objects similar to SCP-93 that are part of the room's wall. The room turns out to be cylindrical in shape with countless copies of SCP-93. Subject turns back to entry point and finds it is a section of the wall that is missing its copy of SCP-93, presumably the one carried with subject. Other sections of the wall on inspection are also found to be missing their copies, leading to speculation that this may be some sort of central array. The subject finds a ladder in the floor while examining the room and proceeds down it at Control's request. The ladder exits into a large clean room full of computer equipment that appears antiquated compared to previously encountered equipment. Large computers running on reel-to-reels are clicking and spinning at various locations. A light bulb of unknown meaning turns on for 10 seconds, then turns off. A large CRT monitor is displaying single words in eight colors at roughly five second intervals. While observed, the words clean, unclean, clean, clean, lost, unclean, flash on the screen. Proceeding through the room, it ends in a large glass window as another observation deck. This deck looks out over another series of tubes as witnessed before, but far fewer and filled with blue liquid. What appears to be electrical current dances over many of the tubes at erratic intervals. At least five tubes at first glance are empty and broken. At the observation window, a keyboard is present on a pedestal, awaiting a selection to be made. The options available on the screen are tube status, which waits for numerical input, reports, situation X549, situation X550, evacuation log, bullshit, agent report, and facility fire plan. The rest of this video was expunged. All selections that generated text were transcribed by subject and verified by a control member who passed them through the portal to recover them. This process took approximately two hours and video feed was deleted to condense this report. Recorded documents are filed at video interrupted. Control lost contact with the subject approximately 30 minutes after departure of control attack. Subject was asked to remain in area and observe the machinery and the containment room and make observations for debriefing. The SCP-93 mirror portal returned to a reflective surface prematurely and all video contact with the subject was lost. The control was unable to re-establish due to SCP-93 being across the mirror. A time lapse of 1 minute and 48 seconds was recorded before a mirror portal re-established itself and subject returned through the portal. Subject appeared to be in good health and condition despite the time loss, but spoke little. During immediate debriefing, subject underwent sudden convulsions and medical staff was alerted. While attempting to subdue subject, he displayed enhanced strength and youth to shoot one of the debriefing staff, killing them. Guards shot the subject once with a sidearm in the heart and once in the chest, but the subject did not fall. All staff evacuated the room and a second shot was fired by subject, which missed. A more heavily armed team entered the debriefing room and used automatic weapons to dispatch the subject. Reports confirm that subject did not bleed when shot, but instead leaked a green-brown substance that seemed to be a mix of solution observed in some containment tubes and the material recovered during test 3. All further SCP-93 tests have been discontinued, while review of materials recovered is in effect. A secondary tape recording device was found to have activated in the field kit after loss of video feed and its contents have been filed with other recovered materials. All recovered materials from SCP-93 testing are level 4 classification. Release must be approved by no fewer than two level 4 personnel. Staff with acceptable clearance, please sign in with Dr. for access to the materials recovered from SCP-93 tests. Well, that's it. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. Hopefully, I'll see you all soon. You're all dismissed. Thank you.